This is a trial like no other. This is a trial like every other. Those apparently irreconcilable statements are both true. It's a trial like no other because of the combination of its length, its size, and the high degree of public interest. The events in question occurred more than 20 years ago, but have haunted the memory of many people and troubled the public conscience. The disappearance and likely murder of three young women was in itself enough to cause wide concern. The fact that all three went missing from a popular nightlife area frequented by many young people inspired a real and pervasive sense of fear. Whilst courts are almost always open to the public, this is often little more than a platitude. In this case, attendance during the trial was strong and sustained. Further publicity, both before and during the trial, was significant. Multiple reporters from various media outlets attended every day. Few trials have been so consistently reported or reported on in such detail. Scarcely any witness passed through the court without being the subject of comment. The axiom that justice must not only be done, but be seen to be done, was never more apt. Over many years, enormous resources were dedicated to the investigation of this matter. Vast quantities of evidence were obtained and witnesses interviewed. That has resulted in an unusually lengthy and detailed prosecution case. Prior to the trial, there were 14 pre-trial hearings over 19 sitting days. The prosecution brief consisted of 178 lever arch files in 44 boxes. The electronic version of the prosecution brief occupied multiple terabytes of computer database space. There were 95 trial sitting days over seven months, 10,828 pages of transcript, 240 witnesses who either were called or had their evidence read, and 2,879 exhibits. But this is a case like every other, because despite the unusual features I've referred to, the fundamental principles that apply to every criminal trial apply to this one. The courts do not deliver different standards of justice. Justice is dispensed without fear or favour, affection or ill will. The promise of equal justice before the law required that this trial, like all criminal trials, be conducted with care to ensure fairness to both the defence and the prosecution. The accused is presumed innocent, the state bears the onus of proof, and the standard of proof is beyond reasonable doubt. Those principles are unqualified, immutable, and uniform in their application. I have not been distracted by the public interest or the publicity from the proper application of those principles. Also, like every other criminal case, it involves the lives of real people. Whatever, whatever interest others may have, a criminal trial is not a performance put on for either their edification or entertainment. The victims were real people who had families that loved them and who deserved to be treated with dignity and respect. Also, as in every criminal case, there is an accused person who stands charged with serious offences and whose fate depends critically on the outcome of this trial. He, like every other accused person, is entitled to a fair trial conducted according to law. The accused, Bradley Robert Edwards, is charged with willfully murdering Sarah Spears, Jane Rimmer and Kira Glennon. In order to be guilty of such a charge, it must be proven beyond reasonable doubt that the accused killed the named person, that the killing was unlawful and that the accused intended to cause death. Sarah Spears was last seen in Claremont in the early hours of the morning of 27 January 1996. She was an 18 year old secretary. She has never been seen again and there has been nothing to indicate that she is still alive. Though her body has never been found, the only reasonable conclusion is that she is dead. Jane Rimmer was last seen in Claremont just after midnight on the 9th of June, 1996. She was aged 23 years old and was employed as a childcare worker. Her body was located in Wellard on the 3rd of August, 1996. Kira Glennon was last seen in Claremont just after midnight on the 15th of March, 1997. She was aged 27 years old and was employed as a solicitor. Her body was located in Eglinton on the 3rd of April, 1997. I'm satisfied that the evidence established that each establishes that each of the victims was abducted and killed. 
the real question is the identity of the killer or killers. In particular, the question in respect of each count is whether it has, it has been proven beyond reasonable doubt that the accused is the killer. The evidence of identity is circumstantial evidence, and in particular, forensic evidence relating to DNA and fibres. In order to prove the guilt of the accused, that evidence must be capable not only of supporting an inference that the accused was the killer in each case, but also of excluding any reasonable possibility that anyone other than the accused could have been the killer. That evidence is strongest in respect of the killing of Kira Glennon. There is also some forensic evidence in respect of the identity of the killer of Jane Rimmer. However, in the case of Sarah Spears, there is no forensic evidence at all. There are two suggested courses of reasoning in respect of each charge. In respect of Miss Glennon and Miss Rimmer, the first course of reasoning is to determine whether similarities between their cases justify a conclusion that they were killed by the same person. And if that conclusion is reached, to then rely on evidence from both cases to determine the identity of that killer. The second course of reasoning is to look at Miss Glennon's case first, and if the identity of her killer is proven, to then use that as propensity evidence in respect of the other charges. This course of reasoning would then turn to the case of Miss Rimmer to determine whether the evidence in that case, together with the propensity evidence, establishes the identity of her killer. In respect of Miss Spears, the first course of reasoning is to determine whether similarities between her case and that of the other two justifies a conclusion that they were killed by the same person and to then rely on evidence from all three cases to determine the identity of that killer. The second course of reasoning is to use proof of the other cases as propensity evidence and to then consider whether that evidence, together with that relating specifically to Miss Spears, establishes the identity of her killer. I've prepared detailed reasons for the conclusions I've reached. This summary forms part of those conclusions. The reasons will be published and be available to anyone who wishes to read them. It is sufficient at this point to state my conclusions. In respect of Miss Glennon and Miss Rimmer, I've reached the following conclusions as to the first course of reasoning. One, there are significant similarities between the circumstances of their disappearances and deaths. Those similarities are, A, both Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon were young women. B, both attended venues in the Claremont area to socialise with friends and were last seen in that area before leaving on their own. C, both went missing in the early hours of a weekend morning. D, both went missing within a nine month period from June 1996 to March 1997. E, in both cases, they were killed in a similar manner, that is, by a sharp force injury to the neck. F, in both cases, there were defensive wounds indicating that they had sought to defend themselves from an attacker armed with a sharp weapon. G, the bodies of both women were deposited in semi-rural locations on the outskirts of the... H, the positions of the bodies and the covering of them with plant material from surrounding vegetation. And I, both had fibres on them that were consistent with having been, with them having been, in a VS Holden Commodore car that was habitually used by a Telstra employee. Those similarities establish beyond reasonable doubt that the same person killed both Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon. Three, the evidence as to the identity of the killer includes the DNA evidence, the fibre evidence and the propensity evidence. Of these, the DNA evidence is critical to the prosecution case. I'm satisfied that the evidence establishes beyond reasonable doubt that the DNA of the accused was under the nails of Miss Glennon, uh, the left hand of Miss Glennon, and that it got there in the course of a violent struggle that occurred sometime before her death. Four, the fibre evidence establishes that each of Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon were in a VS Holden Commodore car that was habitually driven by a Telstra employee in the time shortly before their deaths. 
I'm also satisfied that the accused drove such a vehicle at the relevant times. Five, the propensity evidence of the Karakata incident, which is the only propensity incident that I have relied on for this purpose, establishes that the accused had a tendency to violently attack and abduct young women from the Claremont area. Six, having regard to the DNA evidence, the fibre evidence and the propensity evidence, I am satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the accused was the killer of Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon. And seven, the circumstances of the abductions and the nature of the wounds inflicted proves beyond reasonable doubt that the accused intended to kill each of Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon. The second course of reasoning in respect of Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon leads to the same ultimate conclusions. Applying that course of reasoning, I draw the following conclusions. One, that Miss Glennon was last seen in Claremont in the early hours of the 15th of March, 1997. Two, when last seen, she was in the vicinity of a white VS Holden Commodore. Three, that Miss Glennon was killed by a person wielding a sharp instrument and inflicting a fatal injury or injuries to the neck. Four, that it has been established beyond reasonable doubt that the DNA of the accused was under the nails of Miss Glennon's left hand and that it got there in the course of a violent struggle that occurred sometime shortly before her death. Five, the fibre evidence establishes that Miss Glennon was in a VS Holden Commodore car that was habitually driven by a Telstra employee in the time shortly before her death. I'm also satisfied that the accused drove such a vehicle at the relevant time. Six, the propensity evidence of the Karakata incident, which is the only propensity incident I have relied on, establishes that the accused had a tendency to violently attack and abduct young women from the Claremont area. Seven, having regard to the DNA evidence, the fibre evidence and the propensity evidence, I'm satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the accused was the killer of Miss Glennon. The circumstances of the abduction and nature of the wounds inflicted proves beyond reasonable doubt that he intended to kill Miss Glennon. Miss Rimmer was last seen in Claremont in the early hours of the 9th of June, 1996. <clears throat> Miss Rimmer was killed by a person wielding a sharp instrument and inflicting a fatal injury or injuries to the neck. The fibre evidence establishes that Miss Rimmer was in a VS Holden Commodore station wagon that was habitually driven by a Telstra employee in the time shortly before her death. I'm also satisfied that the accused drove such a vehicle at the relevant time. The propensity evidence of the Karakata incident establishes that the accused had a tendency to violently attack and abduct young women from the Claremont area. And the additional propensity evidence of the killing of Miss Glennon establishes that that, that that tendency developed to killing an abducted young woman using a sharp instrument and disposing of her body in a semi-rural location. Having regard to the fibre evidence and the propensity evidence, including that relating to the killing of Miss Glennon, I'm satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the accused was the killer of Miss Rimmer. The circumstances of the abduction and the nature of the wounds inflicted proves beyond reasonable doubt that the accused intended to kill Miss Rimmer. Those findings lead me to conclude that the accused abducted Miss Rimmer on the early morning of the 9th of June 1996 in Claremont. He used his work vehicle, a VS Holden Commodore station wagon, to drive her from the area. It is not possible to determine exactly how he managed to get Miss Rimmer into the car. He then drove her to Wellard. At some point, a violent struggle ensued. Miss Rimmer was able to scream, but the accused had a knife or other sharp object which he used to attack her. She tried to fend off the attack and incurred a defensive injury to her wrist. The accused then, with intent to kill, stabbed or slashed her with the sharp instrument, causing one or more fatal injuries to her neck. <coughs> Given the screams, it is likely that this struggle occurred at Wellard. The accused removed Miss Rimmer's clothing and disposed of her body in Wellard. He either took or concealed the clothes. He chose a semi-rural location and put her body on the ground before covering her with vegetation he gathered from the surrounding area. 
His intention in doing so was to minimise the chances of her being found and his offence being discovered. The findings also lead me to conclude that the accused abducted Miss Glennon on the early hours of the morning of the 15th of March 1997 in Claremont as she was walking home. He again used his work vehicle, a VS Holden Commodore station wagon, to drive her from the area. It is not possible to determine exactly how he managed to get Miss Glennon into the car. At some point, a violent, a violent struggle ensued in which Miss Glennon scratched or clawed at the accused, thereby getting some of his DNA under her nails. The accused had a knife or other sharp object which he used to attack her. Miss Glennon tried to fend off the attack and incurred a defensive injury to her arm. The accused then, with intent to kill, stabbed or slashed her with the sharp instrument, causing one or more fatal injuries to her neck. Given the pattern of blood soaking <clears throat> on her clothes, it is likely that the fatal wound or wounds was inflicted at Eglinton. The accused then disposed of the body of Miss Glennon in bushland at Eglinton. He chose a semi-rural location and put her body on the ground before covering her with vegetation that he gathered or broke off from surrounding trees and bushes. His intention in so doing was to minimize the chances of her being found and his offense being discovered. In respect of Miss Spears, I've reached the following conclusions as to the first course of reasoning. One. There are some similarities between the circumstances of Miss Spears' disappearance and the death of that of Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon. Those similarities are A, that Miss Spears, Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon were all young women. B, that all attended venues in the Claremont area to socialise with friends and were last seen in that area before leaving on their own. <coughs> C, that all went missing in the early hours of a weekend morning. D, that all went missing within a 14-month period from January 1996 to March 1997, and E, that they were all abducted and killed. Those similarities are of a more general nature and are far fewer than those that exist as between Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon. They do not allow for a conclusion to be reached beyond reasonable doubt that the person who killed Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon must necessarily be the same person as killed Miss Spears. A possibility, or even a probability in that regard, is not enough to support a conclusion beyond reasonable doubt. Accordingly, on the first course of reasoning, evidence as to the identity of the killer of Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon cannot assist in identifying the killer of Miss Spears. As regards the second course of reasoning, in respect of Miss Spears, I've reached the following conclusions. Miss Spears was last seen in Claremont in the early hours of the 27th of January, 1996. She must have been abducted and killed, but the circumstances in which she was taken and how she died are unknown. There are inconsistencies in the evidence of the Mosman Park screams that prevent a conclusion that those screams were Miss Spears. However, even if they were, they can only be explained by her abductor luring her into the car and taking her to her intended destination in a manner that is inconsistent with the Karakata propensity evidence. The evidence in regard to a car seen near a telephone box in Mosman Park does not permit a conclusion to be drawn that it was the source of the screams or that it was a car of the same make or model as that driven by the accused at the time. This leaves only the propensity evidence, being the Karakata evidence and the evidence of the killings of Miss Rimmer and Miss Glennon. The Karakata evidence establishes that the accused had a tendency to violently attack and abduct young women from the Claremont area. The killing of Miss Rimmer and <coughs> Miss Glennon establishes that the tendency developed to killing abducted young women using a sharp instrument and disposing of the body in a semi-rural location. The propensity evidence makes it more likely that the accused was the killer of Miss Spears, but it cannot prove it beyond reasonable doubt in the absence of any other evidence as to the identity 
of her killer. Based on those findings, the verdicts will be as follows. Stand up, please, Mr. Edwards. On count six, that on or about the 27th of January 1996 at Claremont and elsewhere, you willfully murdered Sarah Ellen Spears. My verdict is that you are not guilty. On count seven, that on or about the 9th of June 1996 at Claremont and elsewhere, you willfully murdered Jane Louise Rimmer. My verdict is that you are guilty. <coughs> on count eight, that on or about the 15th of March 1997 at Claremont and elsewhere, you willfully murdered Kira Eilish Glennon. My verdict is that you are guilty. You can sit down. I enter judgments of conviction on counts seven and eight and a judgment of acquittal on count six.